Thank you, Lika, for the introduction. Okay, well, let's switch to uh, bacterium and in particular um, the vaccine-driven adaptation of Botatella pertussis. And, uh, well, we want to know what the role is of the bacterium and the resurgence of pertussis. I have no conflict of interest. And, uh, well, Dimitri mentioned already the, the switch from whole cell to acellular vaccine, but I want to emphasize this as well here. Um, from 1953, because pertussis vaccines became available in 1953 in the Netherlands, and the national immunization program was introduced in 1957. Until 2005, we used the whole cell pertussis vaccine in the Netherlands based off inactivated whole bacteria. This means that the whole bacteria, including all its antigens, is uh, uh, present, in present in the vaccine. But since 2005, we're using an acellular pertussis vaccine only consisting of one to five purified antigens, which I've indicated here, protectin, FHA, two fimbria, fimbrial types, and pertussis toxin. And to remind you, in the Netherlands, we are using a three-component vaccine, protectin, FHA, and pertussis toxin. And when we look at the notifications in the Netherlands, uh, we can see from 1996 uh, an increase, a huge increase. And when we look at the replicular epidemic outbreaks, the numbers uh, during these outbreaks is increasing as well, up to a peak of almost 14,000 cases in 2012. And I've indicated here the switch from whole cell to acellular vaccine, but this has not resulted in a total decrease of notifications. <coughs> and again, possible causes for the resurgence, well, uh, mentioned already, mentioned again, uh, increased awareness, improved diagnostics, and uh, waning <coughs> immunity. And I want to focus on uh, pathogen adaptation in my talk. And what have we found in the last years? Um, we have found antigenic divergence between vaccine strains and circulating strains. And this means that the strains that are currently circulating are genetically different compared to the strains that are included in a vaccine. We have found so-called uh, PTXP3 strains that produce more pertussis toxin. And this means uh, more immunosuppression and the most recent adaptation is the emergence of strains that do not produce one or more vaccine components. And we call these strains vaccine antigen deficient strains. So waning immunity, pathogen adaptation and suboptimal vaccines. Um, yeah, well, um, I want to focus on pathogen adaptation, but why is strain typing uh, so important for us, not only for us, because we want to generate a uh, worldwide standardization to investigate the effects <laughs> of different vaccines, uh, because we are using a three-component vaccine in the Netherlands. For example, in Poland, they are using a whole cell vaccine, and other acellular vaccines are available worldwide. And countries are using different vaccination schedules, and we want to investigate the effects of all uh, these differences on the Bordetella pertussis population. Um, secondly, well, strain typing can serve as a so-called early warning system for epidemics, and I want to show you an example later on. And uh, last but not least, it gives, it gives us uh, the possibility to identify strains that are circulating during these epidemics. And uh, what have we found in the last 65 years in the Netherlands? And uh, why 65 years? Because we started with uh, strain characterization already before, uh, with strains before introduction of vaccination. And I've indicated here the frequencies of the alleles of the vaccine antigens that we have found. And I've combined those alleles to allele types. And here you can see in the 50s, two strains circulating and not surprisingly, the strains that are included in the vaccines, in whole cell vaccines, <coughs> but also in acellular vaccines. <coughs> but you can see here that those strains are completely disappeared nowadays. In the 60s, the first mutation was found in pertussis toxin. And well, from the moment on, we see a huge increase in, number in the number of strains with this new type. This means that this increased uh, bacterial fitness. In the 80s, we saw the first mutation of the second mutation in protectin, and again, an increase in the number of strains. And the most recent adaptation is the mutation in the pertussis toxin promoter, which is involved in the regulation of pertussis toxin. And when we compare the strains that are circulating at the moment, because it's 2015, compared with the vaccine strains, they are genetically different. And 
here you can see the notifications from the from the uh, from the well well from the 90s here in particular, and we can say that the mutation in the pertussis toxin promoter seems to be the most important one. Yeah, and the question is, what will follow after all these mutations? Um, and what it can be the effect of these mismatches on, vac of on the vaccine efficacy? Well, this is the situation that we are currently dealing with. Vaccination, whole cell and acellular vaccine, still old types are uh, included. And when we are infected with the same strain, the vaccine antigens, we, we will get an efficient binding of antibodies. But the current situation is different because the modern strains are genetically different. Strains have mismatches with vaccine antigens. We will get less efficient binding of antibodies and probably in degrees a decrease in vaccine efficacy. And here I want to point out the mutation in the pertussis toxin promoter. I've indicated here the frequencies of both types, the new type and the old type, the PTXP1 type. And here you can see in the green line the frequency of the old PTXP1 strains. And here in red the uh, frequency of the new uh, types. And you can see that it looked li look like that the increase of the PTXP3 strains is associated with increase in notifications. And this new type has completely replaced the old PTXP1 strain. And I've mentioned already the so-called early warning system. And you can see here that when the notifications were, uh, the incidence was quite low, we can could see already that almost 20% had the new type. So this could be a kind of an early warning. So we can, sus can expect that something will happen within the next years. But why is this speed XP3 strain so successful? Well, we've looked at the uh, pertussis toxin production of the PTXP3 strains compared to the old PTXP1 strains. You can see that this ratio is more than 1, more than 1.5. And um, we can say that the PTXP3 strains produce, in this case, 1.6 times more pertussis toxin. And when we looked at another antigen, it's about round 1, so we don't see any difference between the PTXP1 and PTXP3 strains. So we can say that the PTXP3 strains produce more pertussis toxin than the PTXP1 strains. And uh, is this PTXP1 strain only circulating in the Netherlands? Well, this is not the case because uh, at the moment PTXP3 strains are found in North America, Europe, Australia, Asia and South America. Not in Africa, but this can be because we don't have that many strains from Africa. And uh, in Africa, the introduction of vaccination was in the 80s, so we cannot say uh, much about this country. But we think that this strain, PTXP3 strain, transmitted very rapidly uh, over the world. And I want to continue now with another mutation, because I mentioned already the so-called vaccine antigen deficient strains. And here I want to point out that several acellular vaccines are available worldwide. And here again, in the Netherlands, we're using a three-component vaccine. And uh, we have found strains that switch off or inactivate or, how do you call it, do not produce protectin. You can see here the bacterium not producing protectin. So this means that protection is only based on pertussis toxin and FHA. And the first protectin-negative strain was uh, described in France in 2009. They are found nowadays in Finland as well, and in the USA, in Canada, in Japan, and in Australia. But what about the protected negative strains in the Netherlands? Well, we have investigated that, and we've looked at the evolution of the Dutch Bordetella pertussis population uh, in the period 2011 to 2015. And we ha at RVM, we have received 269 strains from diff different medical uh, microbiology labs in the Netherlands. And we have uh, looked at the production or measured the production of the three uh, vaccine components, protectin, FHA, and pertussis toxin. And we have found that 19 strains did not produce protectin. And surprisingly, we have also found two different strains that do not produce FHA, another vaccine component. And we found that all strains still produce pertussis toxin. And we have performed whole genome sequencing of 126 
strains out of these 269 strains, including 13 out of these 19 protecting negative strains. And uh, for the evolution, we have uh, constructed a phylogenetic tree based on, uh, well, a few, no few hundred SNPs. And uh, to come back at the percentage uh, protecting negative strains in the Netherlands, we have found the following. Here you can see the uh, time scale 2001 to 2015. And again, to remind you, the switch from whole cell to acellular vaccine. The first protecting negative strain has been found in, the in, in 2010. We can see an increase of protecting negative strains up to 15% in uh, 2015. And to compare these numbers with, for example, uh, the USA, um, in the USA, more at 85 or more is protecting negative. But as Dimitri mentioned already, they were quite uh, sooner with the introduction of the acellular vaccine in the 90s. And for example, in Australia, I've mentioned here 30, but yesterday I read uh, <coughs> numbers of 80%. So 80% is protecting negative there, and they introduced an acellular vaccine already in 1997. So there must be an association between the, the time that the ACV was introduced and the uh, um, protecting negative strains. And um, it's always nice to find mutations or uh, changes in, uh, in antigens, but what is the consequence when we look at vaccine efficacy? <laughs> well, for this we have, in collaboration with the uh, Dimitris Group in Nijmegen, set up a mouse model. And um, mice were, uh, were unvaccinated and uh, vaccinated with uh, the Dutch, or the, the vaccine that we're using in the Netherlands, the three-component vaccine. Um, my th they were infected with one Bordetella pertussis strain, and we've chosen for two protectin plus and two protectin minus strains. Uh, the unvaccinated mice were terminated at day 1, 3, 7, and 14, and the vaccinated mice at day 3 and 7. And we've looked at the colonization in the nose and in the lung. Um, well, I wanna, this is kind of a conclusion slide, and I want to come back to the uh, pertussis problem in general, because the big question is, why do we see so much pertussis despite vaccination? I want to illustrate th this here. This is the moment when we are vaccinated and we get protection for a, a particular uh, uh, time, and at a certain point, immunity wanes. And this is the old situation, the moment that we get infected by the old PTXP1 strain, but this is the new, s new situation that we are infected with a new strain. And when immunity wanes after acellular vaccines, PTXP3 strains can infect earlier because the points that I've already mentioned, antigenic divergence uh, with uh, <laughs> train. <laughs> More pertussis toxins. <laughs> um, the deletion of the vaccine antigens, a very important part. And yeah, well, other unknown mutations, but well, I think that we, we cannot know everything, but we are doing a lot of whole, whole genome sequencing at the moment. So I think that within a year or two, we uh, will know much more and yeah, what will follow. And he I've here, uh, this is with a, a question, FHA minds, but we have already found strains that do not produce FHA. Well, and to, uh, to repeat a part of Dimitri and Nicoline's story, what can we do? Cocoon strategy, boosters, well, uh, the most important one, maternal immunization, and in the long term, we need better vaccines. Uh, for example, include protein types that are uh, found in circulating strains. Choose an ACV with the broadest immunit immunity because there is a five component vaccine available. An ACV with the highest amount of pertussis toxin and well, maybe include other effective vaccine candidates. And I want to thank the people from the group of at there of RVM, Nicoline, of course, and some people who left the RVM already. And I think Fritz Moy is a very uh, famous person here, maybe. <laughs> and the group who uh, takes care of all our uh, uh, isolates and Nijmegen for the collaboration. Uh, uh, 
uh, concerning the mice experiments, and that was that was it. Thank you.